You're listening to The Naked Pravda. This is Medusa's first and only English language podcast, so please don't be shy about recommending us to your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're tuning in. Welcome to The Naked Pravda. I'm recording this late on Thursday, September 3rd, 2020, and I'm your host, Kevin Rothrock, the managing editor of Medusa's English Language Edition. On today's show, we're going to talk about a story that appeared in the Russian newspaper Kommersant on September 1st that looked like a real bombshell at first, and then turned out to be what my fellow Americans might call a nothing burger. The report, titled Hackers Appeal to the U.S. State Department, American Voter Data Appears on Russian Darknet, credits a Russian hacker platform with posting millions of American voters' personal data, mainly voters in the swing state of Michigan, but also in Connecticut, Florida, and North Carolina, and then profiting off a U.S. government project to pay foreigners for tips about election interference. In the story, Commerçant also quoted experts who warned that the publication of voter data could be a provocation ahead of this year's presidential election in the United States. First, let's sort out what here is true and what is bogus. According to the U.S. State Department, at least, Uncle Sam hasn't paid out a dime to anybody reporting election interference through the government's Rewards for Justice program, an initiative wherein Washington has offered up to $10 million for information leading to the identification or location of any person who works with or for a foreign government for the purpose of interfering in U.S. elections through certain illegal cyber activities. I'll get into this more later on the show, but I want to note that the State Department started spamming random cell phone numbers in Russia and in Iran, actually, with text messages in early August with PSAs, public service announcements, about the Rewards for Justice program. The campaign has been widely mocked in Russia, where ordinary people have complained about unsolicited texts, And Russian state officials have said the U.S. is essentially trying to pay people to denounce their neighbors. The other major falsehood Commerçant reported, or at least implied, is that Russian actors hacked or leaked anything. It turns out that the voter roll information described in the story is all publicly available, either by Freedom of Information Act requests, or it's just floating around online already, legally. In fact, if you go to the platform where this information was shared, which I did, the Russian language cyber criminal form XSS, you'll see that the users themselves know the data is publicly available. And in fact, the user who says he heard about somebody else getting a payout from the U.S. State Department's Rewards for Justice program is only sharing secondhand information. And he sounds pretty skeptical himself. I'll read what he wrote right now. Fuck if I know if it's true, but you could probably try it. The whole point is that all these voter databases are available to the public, regardless of the state, but it's entirely possible that the Americanos themselves don't realize this. That's what somebody with the username Nupagaji wrote. That's the the name of a beloved Soviet cartoon, incidentally. So yes, Commerçant ran a bad story, and many in the United States are now beating themselves up for having worried about it, or worse yet, having talked or tweeted about it. The magazine Foreign Policy spoke to a former CIA analyst who calls the report a cautionary tale and shames those who shared it online for failing to do their due diligence. Michigan's Department of State tweeted out a nifty statement encouraging all Michigan voters to be wary of attempts to hack their minds. That's a turn of phrase, isn't it? But Commerson's report isn't entirely false. On June 29, 2020, a member of the XSS forum with the username Gorka9 did indeed share a RAR file with the voter information of 7.6 million of Michigan's 7.8 million voters, as well as the information of another million voters in four other states. Yes, you can find these data elsewhere. We're talking about full names, birth years, home addresses, voting precincts, gender, and so on. The same account, Gorka9, has posted U.S. marriage license records, Ukrainian voter records, Indian identity card records, Brazilian telephone numbers and names, and lots more all a mix of apparently open source and hacked or stolen data. And all this is from just one account on this platform. So, there is some misbehaving here, to put it mildly. But it's not a Russiagate story, and it's not really a U.S. story at all. Some experts I approached for this podcast episode about this story declined to participate because they were reluctant to amplify a misleading report 
that may have further damaged Americans' admittedly shaken confidence in their own democracy. My fellow Americans, the subject we're discussing on this podcast episode today is not a threat to our voting system, which is no more imperiled now than it was at the beginning of the week. This is not an America story. This is a Russia story. But what does that mean? And why are Russian cyber criminals sharing all this data at all? So XSS is essentially just a cybercrime forum focusing primarily, catering primarily to a Russian-speaking audience. That's Ian Leechko, a cyber threat intelligence analyst in Canada, whom I asked to explain this platform where Gorka9 and his buddies share tips about Michigan voters and a lot more. He says XSS, this forum they're using, is relatively new. It sort of came about a few years ago after its predecessor, uh, Damage Lab, was shut down following the arrest of its most prominent administrator, Sergei Yaretz, uh, in Belarus, approximately late 2017. And so it just, as it said, re-emerged under this new incarnation. It took a little while to build up a following as the arrest of the administrator caused some information about users to be to fall into the hands of the security services in Belarus. But for the most part, it hasn't really changed too much in what it's done. It's people gather there to discuss malware, discuss code, discuss database, discuss and share databases, sell services such as malware or uh, network access, that sort of stuff. I mean, are they committing crimes <laughs> on this forum? Or uh, yeah, there's criminal. Literally, like the if if I were to just repost every bit of data that they share on the forum, like on Twitter, eventually somebody would say, okay, you've you've committed a crime <laughs> now. That I can't really speak to. That would be based on, indi- on jurisdictions of individual countries. What can you tell me about this Gorka 9 user? Because apparently this user likes to dump information online on this forum specifically. Do you have any sense of, of why or even who this person is? Like what, what, are, what other kinds of data has Gorka9 posted on either XSS or, or anywhere else? From what I've gathered, I don't know much about who the individual Gorka9 is. Really, I haven't come across that name before in, just in my research. For the most part, the type of da- data they're dumping is not... It's all free. So they're taking stuff that other cyber criminals have already exposed, and then they're just condensing it and sharing it in one in a new format. So a lot of the forums, XSS included, do have some elements of gatekeeping. So there's sort of, after you attain a certain number of posts, you can access certain parts of the forum or post the opening poster can hide certain things behind a post limit. So like you can't see a password to access a dump, for example, if you haven't made so many posts. So by making so, by posting things like this, it counts as just easy posts. It, that allows you to start moving upwards and accessing content. And what's the point? What would you guess the point is of sharing publicly available information on a hacker forum where they generally ex- discuss, you know, exploits and things like that? Like why why even share 7.6 million people's names, addresses and voting precinct, you know, locations from Michigan? Like what's why why would a, a group of Russian hacking enthusiasts give a shit about that. That information can be monetized. It just takes effort. You'd have to combine it with other information from other publicly available, various other publicly available dumps, and you sort of go from there. But a lot of that, when combined with other data, can be used for fraud. I guess, though, it should be noted that, and this is the security industry, it's, that's the industry I'm in, sort of what are the, how sort of looking at the worst scenarios and how things can be used. But I mean, as was very widely discussed across all of their many, many sources, everybody's sort of jumping on bandwagons, jumping to conclusions on what this relatively small amount of data, publicly available data can be used for. The biggest thing I guess to remember, at least in my mind, is and we've had Dr. Mark Galliotti cover the connection between organized crime and the Russian security services quite extensively for quite a while. These people are still individuals. Like Gorka is still a guy. He comes to this forum to conduct ultimately business transactions, to ask questions and interact with others in the business. They don't want this attention. They would rather everything be quiet. They can go about their, they can go about their what they would consider job and be left in peace. And now effectively they just don't want to lose the forum again like they did with Damage Lab earlier. They're aware that the security researchers are 
there. They know that many, many people have access to them, to these forums and many of the security researchers at least are aware of the form, if not have, having specific access. And they'll act accordingly. Like they'll put enough detail to generate interest in a post if it's something special, like a network access to an, to a company or to, uh, a private database that they themselves were able to steal. They'll put enough information to generate that interest, but then interested parties will reach out to them through private messaging and more information can be shared that way. So it's treated sort of, it's, it's a marketplace. They share, they discuss, and yeah, it's criminal activity, but they also want to be left alone so that they can do this without law enforcement coming in. As I mentioned at the top of the show, the story about Russian cyber criminals sharing U.S. voter data is weird because it's ostensibly another Russiagate story. But in fact, it was reported entirely in Russia by Russian journalists. And that's not how Russiagate stories have typically played out. Yes, it fizzled out, like most Russiagate stories. But Kamersan's article stands out nevertheless. Oleg Shakirov, a consultant at the Peer Center in Moscow and an expert in European security and digital diplomacy, told me that he also thought it was all a bit odd. First of all, I think it was uh, this like weird feeling yesterday because usually you have a publication in the, in the US media and Russian officials kind of disputing it. And yesterday it was vice versa. So we had a publication in Russian media and the American like FBI and uh, CISA and everyone else, they were just saying, no, it's not, it's not correct. So it was upside down. Yeah, you, so usually, I mean... There were so many stories over the past couple of years, so I think there are several patterns, but like a typical pattern would be like uh, like this. There would be a story in, in a major publication like New York Times or Washington Post, and then it would, within hours, it would appear on Russian media and someone would ask Dmitry Peskov, Kremlin's spokesperson, or foreign ministry, or Duma members, and they would say, all kinds of stuff that they they have not be, been briefed about this or that it's not true and that this is a typical kind of information confrontation and cooked up stories. So usually it's like this. One of Kamersan's sources on, on the, the, the original story argued that this, well, the, at the time they were still referring to it, I guess, as a leak of information. But the, the notion that these Russian this Russian hacker community was interested in U.S. voter data. They described it as the first stage of preparations for accusations against Russian hackers of interference in the U.S. presidential election. I've kind of struggled to understand what that means. Like, do you have any sense of what what that source was talking about? I don't know how how it's seen from the United States, but so in Russia, I, I'm talking about this like general public opinion. So everyone grew a bit tired of these Russian hackers stories over like past four years. And there is generally this like skepticism whenever there, there are Russian hackers involved, people are kind of a bit skeptic about this. So I think this this comment, like I don't know who, who who said it, but it falls into this line that these are all not like real stories, and now we have this uh, kind of like small like small development that will be used by by U.S. authorities to to further like feed this this narrative about Russian interference. So, so I think this is what it meant, but but I'm, I'm not sure that the, the person was very much familiar with, with what happened because it turns out it's not it's not like that. Actually, there is a there is a similar story uh, uh, involving not uh, like American hacks or leaks alleged, but uh, Russian hacks. So in, in the beginning of the summer, there was a, a story in, on Russian media about some some hackers selling database of, of Russian citizens who were allegedly stuck abroad and uh, who registered via Russian public services website to receive some kind of support from the government. And they so these hackers were claiming that they were selling uh, this information. And uh, it was not clear whether it, w it was real information or just this kind of a similar attempt to, to sell publicly available information. So like from, from what I see over like last year, maybe there is an increased number of these stories that where people try to to grab public attention to sell ca some kind of data, and uh, these these people who were selling that like foreign ministry allegedly foreign ministry related data, they even hacked one of foreign ministry's Twitter accounts to to kind of 
make everyone believe that they actually had access to not only to their Twitter account, but to, to, to the data. But I don't know, this was never uh, uh, confirmed. I think there are like many data sets floating around and people are trying to to sell those. So you can apparently make money. Writing on her Telegram channel earlier this week, Russian political analyst Tatyana Stanovaya called Commerçant's report strange, arguing that the article's clear subtext is to fault the U.S. State Department for provoking leaks of American citizens' data by rewarding Russian hackers for information about election interference. Alek Shakirov says his father actually received one of the State Department's text messages. Given how ridiculous the outreach campaign was, it seems clear that Commerson's story about Russian hackers exploiting the American project has a ready-made audience, even if the story's untrue. There was another piece in this story which was kind of amusing about the, this Rewards for Justice award that, that one of the like forum users apparently received from the United States. And it was also, as far as I know, it was disputed by, by, by the State Department that they said they never paid it. But it was it was fun because uh, back in August when when uh, State Department announced this, some um, like Russians started receiving um, like random people started receiving uh, text messages with this. Even even my dad he received the text message and I asked him yesterday whether uh, he would be okay if I told the story and he said yes. Please tell the story and say that uh, I'm upset that they didn't pay me ten million dollars. So there you go. But yeah, maybe maybe there was a there was a, co- a commentary by Tatiana Snovaya, who is Russian uh, political scientist and commentator, and she she said that maybe this story was was going to be used as to show that this kind of awards like bounties basically are counterproductive. kind of like a ridiculous tactic, right? In terms of like diplomatic tactics to try and get information, spamming a bunch of phones with this kind of request is not maybe the most strategic or, you know, strategic tactic. That's Yana Garakovskaya, an independent researcher on Russian politics, formerly at the Harriman Institute. When I asked her about the apparent oddness of Commerçant's story, she pointed out that it needs to be read from the perspective of its intended audience, Russians not Americans. I think that the point of the story was for a Russian audience to highlight these kinds of sort of absurdities in the American system. And the way that then the story unraveled, like we found out that actually all this information isn't like leaked or hacked. It's all publicly available anyway, which then if you don't really understand kind of freedom of information in the American context, if you're a Russian reader, it sounds even more ridiculous, right? Like there's all this paranoia about election interference and Russian hacking and like Russia being the boogeyman of the American elections. And then it turns out like Americans post this information for anybody. So you don't even need to hack them. They gave you this information. So I think the, you know, the, the audience is definitely Russian for it. And it's, I don't know if it's preparing for accusations of election meddling, but it certainly, you know, feeds into that narrative. It's hard to say. I mean, Kamersan, you know, has a relatively good reputation, but but then media, the atmosphere, you know, the general atmosphere or ecology for media in Russia is definitely worsening, as we've seen over the last little while. How would you describe, generally speaking, over you know over the past four years or so, Russian diplomatic and public messaging when it comes to allegations of U.S. election meddling? Because I mean, you know, obviously they deny doing it. But it's not just a denial. It's also, as you mentioned, sort of ridicule. Like, how would you kind of summarize for people unfamiliar with the the rhetoric coming out of Moscow, what what they've been saying? So on the one hand, it is a blanket denial. On On the other hand, the strategy of trying to influence existing existing narratives that are already in place in American politics and just trying to amplify them gives you a little bit of plausible deniability too, because you can say, well, you know, it's not like Russians didn't didn't invent racism in the US, right? That's not a Russian creation. They amplify those voices, they kind of deepen those divisions, but they don't create those problems. But then there's the other side of it where the narrative in the US has been so focused on Russian interference that that's, I think, also been kind of taken up by the Kremlin and by sort of propaganda outlets in Russia to say like, look, now we're at fault for everything. Every problem in the U.S. is now Russia's fault. 
And so these kind of narratives in the two countries, I think, feed on each other. And, you know, they strip away all this nuance. And you do, I mean, you do sometimes see on American news, you know, congressmen and others just sort of blame Putin for things that are totally unconnected to what they happen to be talking about at the time. And then those clips are replayed in Russia to say, look, we're at fault suddenly for poverty and racism and protests and whatever else. So I think, you know, the strategy is kind of, there's different elements in it. There's denial of actual attempts at purposeful interference. And then there's amplification of some of the more extreme kind of rhetoric that comes out of the U.S. blaming Russia for certain things. So I think it has this dual, you know, we, we, de- we definitely didn't do it. And as always, they blame us for everything. You've been listening to The Naked Pravda, an English language podcast from Medusa. On today's show, we spoke to three analysts working on cyber threats, digital diplomacy, and Russian politics to pick apart a very controversial, not especially well-researched article published in Commerçant this week about Russian hackers sharing open-source U.S. voter data. The Naked Pravda is a podcast from Medusa, our first English-language show, and I hope you recommend us to your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're tuning in, to help put this program in front of more people. Thank you for listening, and come back soon. Finally get